What I want to talk about today is something much more serious than what we've been talking about so far this morning, and that's cancer. And this session is called Imagine If, and my Imagine If, or my dream, would be that one day we have a cure for this terrible disease. And that comes from 30 years of looking after patients that have cancer and trying to understand what causes the disease and how we might be able to do better. The first thing I want to tell you is cancer is not one disease. Just as everyone has a unique thumbprint, when you look at it superficially, they all look the same. But the closer and closer you get to it, they're actually all different. The same is true for every breast cancer, for every colon cancer. It's actually completely different, even though there are what I've referred to on this slide as common genetic themes. The second thing that I'd like to point out is that cancer develops very, very slowly over many, many years. And as such, it reflects years of ongoing evolutionary selection. It's a very, very complex disease and we only ever begin to treat it very late in its course. So on this slide, I've actually shown you what some cancer cells look like and I've chosen leukemia cells because they are ones that we're familiar with and in the top panel in the middle, you can see a normal white blood cell surrounded by red blood cells. So this is a normal white blood cell and the rest of the panel here is showing leukemic cells. And right down here, you can see one leukemic cell that's dividing. And over here, I've enlarged that and you can see the chromosomes lighting up here as the cell divides and you can imagine this cell splitting and giving rise to two leukemia cells. Those chromosomes I've diagrammed here in green are made up of DNA, you all know that, and on those chromosomes are lined up genes. One gene might give rise to enzymes, another gene might give rise to a hormone, and so on. They're too tiny to see, but we can actually see the chromosomes, and this is an electron micrograph of two chromosomes lined up, getting ready to divide, and you can see that they're unequal. That's because the large chromosome here is the X chromosome, and this tiny little wimpy chromosome, responsible for most of the problems in the world, is the Y chromosome. <laughs> At least that's what my wife tells me. <laughs> so the fundamental concepts that I'd like to leave with you, I'm not finished yet, are outlined on this slide. First, cancer begins in a single cell. It acquires multiple changes, multiple genetic abnormalities, but despite that, a cancer cell remains very, very similar to the normal cell. And that explains why so many of our treatments have adverse effects on the normal cells, because they're really very, very similar. The implications for treatment are that metastases, and I'll tell you what I mean by that on the next slide, actually what kill patients, not the primary tumour. And these metastases occur very early, and they're at such small levels you'd need a microscope throughout the whole body to see them. Tumour evolution continues even when treatment is commenced and there is very, very limited time for intervention. So on this slide, you can see what I mean by metastases. So here diagrammed is a breast cancer, but the same would be true for colon cancer, prostate cancer or uh, any other cancer that you like to name. And the primary cancer here is shown in the breast. It's very, very rare that the primary cancer actually causes any problem other than cosmetic. It's almost certainly not going to kill you. But what will kill you is that the cancer can spread to the lymph nodes, the lung, the liver, or the bones. And that can severely compromise liver function or lung function or bone function, and it's that that kills people. And we refer to that as the secondary cancer. So this diagram here, this patient doesn't have liver cancer, they have breast cancer that's spread to the liver. And this spread we refer to as secondaries or metastases. In two slides I want to give you some sense of the problem we face as a society with respect to cancer. The first is that with each increasing decade, there is essentially a doubling the risk of developing cancer. So people in their 50s have about a 1 in 20 risk of developing cancer, and people in their 80s, it's as low as 1 in 3. And this is going to get to be a bigger and bigger problem as our population ages. So if you look on the column on the extreme left of the slide, 
in the 1960s, approximately 10% of people were over 65 years of age and had the concomitant risk of developing cancer. And projecting forward into 2020, you can see that approximately double the number of people will be over 65 years of age. So we have seen an increase in cancer. We will continue to see an increase in cancer. This will continue to be a genuine burden on our society. I want to spend most of the time talking about what this means in terms of what's going on within the cell and what's actually happening within the body, because I think this is the best way of understanding the enormous challenge we face in my hope, in my dream, becoming true. On this slide, on the horizontal axis, you can see two things illustrated. First, the number of cells, and cancer, I've told you, begins in a single cell, 10 to the zero, one cell. And you can see the number of cells increasing on the horizontal axis. Underneath, an estimate of the size of the tumour that would be present. You can see on the horizontal axis the rate at which the tumour grows. So in this early phase, there is what we refer to as exponential growth. So one cell gives two, two give four, four give eight, eight give 16, and so on. And there is a high growth rate in this early phase. At about a size of a million cells, the tumour is no longer able to get its nutrition by diffusion and the tumour has to take advantage of the normal host mechanisms and make its own blood supply. That's called neovascularization, new blood vessels. And at that time is when cancer actually begins to spread. And starting from the primary tumour moves to the lung, the liver, the lymph nodes and so on. So then at about 10 to the 9 cells, at a gram of tumour, that's the first time that we can detect cancer with all of the tests that we've got available to us. And a gram, as you would know, is something about the size of a pea. And you can imagine if there's a pea-like lump, someone might feel it in their breast, there might be a, a, a polyp in their colon and so on. That's the time when it first becomes detectable. At a tumour mass of about 10 to the 12 cells, a million million cells, that's incompatible with life. And that's a mass the size of a of a, a basketball, let's say, spread throughout the body. And on the very top, you can see the number of cell divisions that are associated with those sorts of changes. So a single cell, if it divided and there was no cell death, there would be 40 cell doublings that would be present between the initiation of the cancer and the death of the patient. Now this line here, 10 to the 9, a billion cells, is really very important because that's the threshold for clinical detection. So if someone has cancer and uh, they're treated for their cancer and the number of cells falls below that line, we say they're in remission. Unfortunately, the cancer hasn't been eradicated. What we're really saying is that, that there are less than a billion cancer cells that, and we just can't detect them below that level of sensitivity. When the cancer cells cross that line, then we say the cancer has relapsed. And really, from one point of view, nothing very much has changed. They've just crossed this threshold of clinical detection. So this a billion cancer cells is very important because that's the threshold at which we can first detect cancer. And everything that takes place in the clinic then occurs between 10 to the 9, a billion cancer cells or a thousand million cancer cells, and 10 to the 12, a million million cancer cells. So let me try and illustrate that with uh, what happens when we're treating patients. And again, I've chosen someone with leukaemia. I will remember a 19-year-old fellow that presented to our department. He'd won the, the best footballer on the football field the week before, the most valuable player. And then he came into the clinic uh, very ill the week later because he had developed leukaemia. And it's that type of dramatic change from being most valuable player on the football field to presenting with leukaemia a week later that gives the impression that cancer develops like that. It doesn't. It develops very, very slowly. And even though he didn't know it, he'd probably had leukaemia for two or three years before he presented to our department. And that's diagrammed here. So he presented with leukaemia and he was treated. Then the number of leukaemic cells decreased crossing below this critical threshold of a billion cells. And we said, this is wonderful, you're in remission. And it is wonderful. But the leukemic cells slowly, relentlessly continue to increase until they cross that threshold again. And then we say, your leukemia has relapsed and we initiated treatment again. 
Now, one of the common misconceptions that we have when we think about cancer is that cancer cells grow very rapidly. It's simply not true. Cancer cells grow very, very slowly. In fact, they grow much more slowly than their normal counterpart, and we couldn't treat cancer patients if anything else were the case. So that's illustrated here. So when he came into hospital, his normal cell count is shown here in the purple broken line. The normal cells are killed by the chemotherapy treatment, just like the tumour cells, and they decrease. But then they recover and rebound very quickly, and as soon as they've recovered and rebounded, we can give the next cycle of treatment. So we do that, and then the tumour cells slowly die, the normal cells die very quickly, and then they rebound again, as shown here. And again, we're able to give the next cycle of treatment. So the normal cells always recover much more quickly than the tumour cells. And I've tried to say that at the bottom, the normal cells have greater proliferative potential than the cancer cells. And if that wasn't the case, we couldn't actually treat any of these tumours. And I've only seen one young man where the tumour cells grew more quickly than the normal cells and we had no treatment that we could give him. Because when we used this sort of approach, the tumour cells actually recovered more quickly than the normal cells. Why is that? If you take a normal white blood cell progenitor or parent cell, it's able to give rise to about 10,000 daughter cells in the space of a week. Enormous potential for growth and proliferation. Whereas if you take a leukemic cell, it'll, at the best, give rise to two or three daughter cells over the course of the next couple of weeks. So what's the difference? The difference is that the normal cells do their job, behave properly and die. The cancer cells hang around forever. And the normal cells are receiving lots of negative signals saying, stop, we've got enough of you, stop growing, you don't need any more of you, you've done your job, it's time to die. And they respond to those signals. But the cancer cells do not. So I really want you to get the message that cancer cells grow very, very slowly. In fact, more slowly than their normal counterpart. And cancer therapies wouldn't be effective if this were not the case. Yet, we have this common misconception that cancer cells grow very, very rapidly. So in summary of this section, a normal cell shown over on the extreme left acquires some sort of change in its genes. That results in the yellow cell, which is expanded. That acquires an additional change in its genes to give rise to the orange and the red and so on. This typically takes many, many years. So if we're talking about breast cancer or colon cancer, the common adult cancers, this probably takes typically 20 or 30 years. So the reason that we see the disease being more common in people in their 80s than in their 50s is because they've simply had more time for these sorts of genetic changes to reveal themselves and the cancer to become evident. I want to briefly tell you what this means in terms of trying to treat patients with cancer. So we currently have several treatments available for cancer. We have local treatments, which are really very blunt when trying to treat such a highly evolved disease. So we have surgery and radiotherapy. And then we have treatments that go throughout the body, such as chemotherapy, hormone therapies, the newer targeted therapies, and perhaps very soon, immunotherapies. So what does this mean? And what is the most significant advance we've had in terms of cancer treatment over the last couple of decades. Well, from my point of view, and that's all you're going to get today, the most significant advance is what we refer to as adjuvant therapy. So it's the recognition that the spread of the cancer cells to the liver, the lung, and the bone had occurred long before the patient ever knew they had cancer. There is no way we could treat that because we didn't even know that the cancer was there. So this is called adjuvant therapy. And so we take people that have got cancer and we think this is early stage cancer from all of our tests, but we know that at least some of them must have had cancer cells that spread to the liver, the lungs, the bone marrow and so on. So we introduce treatment with chemotherapy to kill that micrometastatic disease that we can't even see, that's invisible to us, but we know must be there. And to my mind, this represents the single most significant advance we've had in cancer therapy over the last couple of decades. And it's certainly made a difference in terms of outcomes, particularly for breast and colon cancer. 
I've told you that this is a highly evolved disease. The evolution continues once treatment begins, and that's why we use combinations of treatment in cancer. So we use one treatment, treatment A, that will kill some of the cancer cells, but others will be uh, refractory to that treatment. And then we introduce treatment B, that kills some of the other cancer cells. And that's the reason we have combination therapy treatments for cancer patients. So the key messages that I'd like to leave with you is that this is a disease that begins in one cell that acquires multiple genetic mutations. Not all of them are important. Some of them are bystander effects, but if you acquire the critical genetic changes, then the cancer cell is able to move from that white cell to the yellow to the orange. Despite these changes, the cancer cell and the normal cell are really very, very similar, very hard to tell them apart. So the treatments that are crude often get the two muddled up. It's the metastases, not the primaries, that kill. Tumor evolution and selection is ongoing, and there is very, very limited time for therapeutic intervention. Finally, a personal perspective. So cancer research and the challenge for cancer treatment is enormously difficult. But we've also made enormous progress over the last 20 years, and the sorts of treatments that are available today for cancer patients were unimaginable when I was in medical school. And the outcomes for cancer patients are very different today than they were 20 years ago. So we've made enormous progress. And although this is somewhat of a depressing subject to consider in a forum like this, I remain incredibly optimistic that we will one day be able to address this dread disease. And I'm very optimistic that someone out there, the next generation of researchers and physicians, will contribute substantially to our understanding in this area. Thank you very much for your attention.